In August of 1898, stockholders met and organized the Edenton Cotton Mill. To recruit workers, business leaders went into Terrell and surrounding counties to recruit people to move to Edenton to become employees of the Edenton Cotton Mill. My grandfather was a tenant farmer, and at the end of the year he had nothing to show for it. So they, they walked, walked, took the carpet bags and walked 13 miles to Edenton. Grinley got a job and he got a house over here on Church Street. And uh, so he, he could walk to the mill. It was probably about 100 yards from the mill. So They were starving as tenant farmers. You know, we're talking about a period after the Civil War. The, the Whiteman family owned land and lost it during that time and survived as tenant farmers, and the, the mill provided a steady income, you know, something they, they could do. And, and both the Tweedy family and the Whiteman family, I've, I've heard the grandparents say that, that you know, we, we were starving, you know, we were just not making it, and the mill offered a steady income. James Robert Wright always lived in Alligator, but one of his sons came to work in the mill when it first opened. By 1950, as more of his children moved to the village, 40 to 50 percent of the residents of the Mill Village were his descendants. Uh, even though he didn't work here, he didn't live here, but half the Mill Village yeah. is related well, to it. If you're talking about uh, families, they will probably be uh, the largest family connection uh, in the Mill Village. My family came from Terrell County, and they came over and uh, enlisted people to come to work in the mill. They get a house, low rent, garden space, you know, all that. And I think that my, my grand, grandfather made the decision to come, as did a lot of people from Terrell County. They came from a um, farming family in Alligator, and they came over and to get a job here. And I was told that my uncle was not old enough to work. So at six, he took a piece of paper and wrote 16 on it and put it in his shoe. And when they asked him if he was 16, he said he was standing on 16. When they came over here, all of a sudden, they had a job. It wasn't a high-paid job, mind you, but you might have three or four members of the family working in the middle, and they all in, in one of the larger houses. So you had a house, you had a job, and you still had the garden that you were living on when you were in Columbia. And the advantage to the employee was they could walk to work, they could walk to church, their kids could walk to school, the, there were stores on the perimeter, they didn't have to have a car. As an employee of the Edenton Cotton Mill, you were allowed to rent a home from the mill within the village, giving your family a job, adequate shelter, and enough backyard space for your own garden. The number of people that worked in the mill in your family determined how big a house you got. The more people, if your kids grew up and worked in the mill, you, you were eligible for a larger house. The houses that have two doors on it actually house two families. And it's hard for me to believe that two families could live. I think they had a room apiece and shared a kitchen. I think the living was pretty good. If you look at it now compared to you know, me all the way in town, though, uh, the water was pumped out on the street. I don't know if that was the only water, but I know that there was water, you know, the water pumps along the street all over the mill village. When they first put the water in, it was a spigot on the street, and people had to come in with their buckets, water buckets, and get their drinking water and bathing water and whatever. No bathrooms. Uh, there was an outhouse when I was a little girl, and, uh, and we used to take our baths when it was nice and warm in a, a wash tub. In fact, we did that in the wintertime. They would heat water on the stove in a kettle and put it in the tin tub, and that's what we bathed in. The outhouses, several, have I said outhouses, they disappeared sometime after World War II. And then we had what well, was a utility sink inside with, with water, running water. Mr. Watson would come with a horse and wagon and dump the coal. The mill company made sure that happened. He would dump the coal and they'd put it on a bill up here that we got the coal. That was his job, delivering coal to all the people right here. He had a horse and cart. 
He, he kept the horse tied up behind the mill. And you know, during the night, he, he, if he weren't late, it got dark. He'd keep him in that old horse house right there behind the mill. But during the day, he'd deliver coal to each everybody's house. And in the beginning, we had a window fan, and there was a way you could open windows and shut doors to make a draft drop through the house. And Mama would do that at night, and I would lay at the foot of the bed and let the breeze blow across me there. And, and several people <clears throat> had animals. I mean, the Rogerson family had a horse. There were pig pens back there on, on the company land that people kept pigs. A lot of people had gardens because a lot of them were fishermen they had boat houses at the creek. And on Saturday morning, you could hear boat motors starting up right and left. At the creek was the boat houses, like I said, and then everybody over here, you had gardens. Most everybody, the majority of people, because a lot of them farmed and raised their own, had chickens. We had chickens at one time here at my house in the backyard. They, they had a self-sufficiency, and they were pleased to have this steady income. You know, they had seen the rougher times. Working and living on the Mill Village became more than just a job. It became a way of life for many families and stretched across several generations. Uh, two doors down from our house was Miss Sissy. Miss Sissy Wright was her name. She was in her 90s in those days, and she was still living in the mill house where she and her husband had lived, worked, and raised their children. And she would tell you things about, about growing up in the mill. Her grandparents had worked in the mill. Her parents had worked in the mill. She and her husband had worked in the mill and then her children had worked in the mill. My mama started working in there, she was 12 years old. She was a spinner, what they call a spinner. My daddy worked in the quarter and the bells of cotton would come in and they, they run it through, through different machines till they get it to the spinning room, put it on bobbins. He said, the way you work, we sure like to have you at that mill. So I worked on the yard maybe six, seven years and then I, kept asking about going inside with a machine. I was the first black person working on the inside. I never had a complaint about laying out. I never had a complaint about I didn't do my work. I was a working man. Well, when I first went to work there, I was in school. Al Phillips gave me a job sweeping the floor. I made a dollar an hour. I was 16 years old. You know, I made eight dollars eight dollars a day, and that was a lot of money for me back then in the fifties. Paydays was on Friday between nine thirty and ten o'clock. The supervisors would go in the office about nine and get checks. My daddy was a supervisor, and he'd get checks. And people on the second, third shift, not the first shift, they'd be paid last. The supervisors would go pay them once they paid the second, third shift off. But people used to congregate right there, or right there in the middle of that street, to get checks. And I still see them fresh in my mind. They were laughing and talking or in a hurry. And you remember things like that. My history is I started when I was a teenager. Uh, they had a summer program uh, back in the 60s, uh, latter 60s. And uh, uh, they hired, you know, young kids. And we painted porches. We uh, painted roofs. We painted houses. We painted those houses out there in the middle, middle village. We, we painted those houses. Mama would get my check every Friday and I'd just tell her to take what she wanted out of it and give me the rest. I was also a watchman. Every hour you had, I think it was about 13 or 14 stations you had to uh, be at because each station had a key and you had to, when you went to a station you had to put the key and you had to you know, turn the key and then you went to the next station, uh, you know, just checking make sure everything that was everything, everything was secure. Mm -hmm. My aunts and uncles all worked in the cotton mill and they didn't stop work when they came home. You know, my uncles would always have something to do. They never stopped. Like I said, uh, me and my wife walked and we walked through the village and I'm looking at those uh, houses, I'm looking at the porches and sometimes you run into some of the people that live there and you know, we strike a conversation and I would tell them, you know, I said, I painted that house or I or painted that roof or, you know, this is where I used to hang out. From what Sissy told me was that it never occurred to her 
that they would go anywhere else. Her grandparents worked there, her parents worked there, she worked there, her husband worked there, some of her children worked there. She had just never occurred to her that they would ever go anywhere else. I don't know that she felt like she had to stay there. She just, it never came up. So there's a sort of a, a graduation that you can see from Columbia through the generation, each one getting economically better off. No, my mother wanted to make sure I didn't work in that mill. So her, the most important thing to her was getting me through high school and, and not having to go in the mill because it was very hard work. They worked hard. Our parents and grandparents worked really hard and they knew the value of good work and they knew that they could do better for themselves, but they especially wanted to do better for their children. I don't think either of our grandmothers worked in the mill, but both of our grandfathers, and as far as I know, our great-grandfathers. I'm a third generation, and my son's actually a fourth generation. The formation of the Edenton Cotton Mill in 1900 strengthened the economy of the town of Edenton as no previous industrial pursuits had done. The cotton mill was organized and funded entirely by local men, and the profits remained in the town. Leaders dating back to the 1900s included the first president, Frank Wood, John Wood, John Moore, Philip McMullen, Al Phillips, Gilliam Wood, James Cates, and Leo Katkovic. My grandfather, James William Cates, he was the superintendent here from 1921 until his death in 1949. But I know that he had a great amount of respect in the community. My mom told me that they were, the workers were in awe of him. They were good people. They were respected and some dearly beloved. Like Philip McMullen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He was beloved by the people who lived on the mill village. He came in 1919 as shipping clerk. Uh, working in the back, but he spent a lot of time learning all about the equipment in here, and it wasn't, he'd already had two years at uh, Trinity College, which is now Duke, so uh, they had him in the office fairly soon, so he began to uh, move into the uh, administrative part of the business, and then after, after World War II, uh, Daddy became the manager. We met well with this man, and he said, he said what a fair man he was. He said he was hard to work for, but he was fair with the way he did things. I could walk in this office and the president knew me by name. They knew all of they the all children. They all knew all of us. You could come right here and talk to the president or the vice president or you know, right, right, interview and he knew you just like I knew you. He, you know, it was, it was, they knew each other, we knew each other. They got to be real good friends with us. You know, that's why I said on the last, it was nice, like a family thing, right. black and white. When I made Majorette, mm -hmm. my mom came down and talked to Mr. Dick Elliott and got money uh -huh. to buy my uniform. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they took it out of her paycheck every week. Well, it's blame for the cotton mill, the tang would never survive. The mill did not have a company store, so that the people here increased the um, business in the downtown stores. I heard one, um, the man at the shoe store would give credit to the people over here, and some people in town would ask him why he would do that, and he said, because they pay their bills. You take 75 families or 71 families, and then all of a sudden they've all got to go shopping here in town. The dealers in town liked to do business with people on the mill village because they knew they were going to be paid. They had steady jobs with an income, and they paid their bills. They did not close during the Depression. And one of the minutes says, one of the uh, Board of Directors minutes says, we are, we are cut back on our production mm -hmm. instead of letting people go. What they do is they had to cut back to one shift, and they divided it up so that everybody got something. This mill survived longer than most of the textile mills did because they were a specialty mill and they were out of the mainstream. So, you know, they didn't know that the world was changing. And to our good luck, in our good, uh, good fortune, it didn't change before we escaped.
Growing up in the village provided a number of benefits. Residents never lacked friends to experience life with, always had a place to play, and were never without a built-in support system when it was needed. It was a unique experience. People were good people, plain, ordinary, hard-working people. And we lived in a village-type environment, which it is. I guess being together day in and day out and knowing each other's family. You know, you know each other. Living together has a sense of having a family. I knew every single person that lived in every single house on this mill valley. You'd go by, they'd be sitting on a porch, you'd end up sitting on a porch with them and yeah. everything. It was just like everybody was everybody's friend. I thought I, I had fun growing up here. I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. But every day we'd come home from school, if you know, was in school, we'd get our poles, we'd take off, we had a special spot to fish off of down to the creek. If you won't fish, we'll be playing ball out here. My grandma would take me fishing down behind the mill where the, the walk is, walkway is now, and my grandma would dig the worms from the soil there, mm -hmm. beside that, and we'd go down and fish. In the mornings when we got to her house in the summertime, she would line us up, give us all a fishing pole, march us down to the water. We would go down there and catch the little brim. She would bring them home and clean them and cook them, and they'd be ready when the mill whistle blew at 12 o'clock. And anybody that wanted to eat would when I ride over here at Christmas time and I see a tree, it makes my heart feel happy with the memories because we've got hundreds and hundreds of memories from this mill village right here. You know, the kids were all over, everywhere, everybody's, everybody's house was everybody's house, you know. You never liked for, for playmates. Oh, I, well, it was a great place to live. I mean, great growing up in this place, it was the greatest place in the world, I thought. Uh, I wouldn't change my childhood for nothing. And well, I always said that we didn't have telephones on the mill village, but we had to tell a neighbor. <laughs> if I did anything wrong over here, by the time I was home, my mother knew it. <laughs> and I would say, how do you know? And she said, a little bird told me, and I used to say, if I could find that bird, <laughs> I would kill. <laughs> and you had to behave yourself and you had to uh, conduct yourself in a nice manner. So it, it was it was like a family and I'd say I never used that word until I you know, thought about it as such but everywhere was home. The biggest thing we did especially in the summertime was play ball on the ball field. We played two games a day sometimes early in the morning then again in the, in the 8 a p.m. We played baseball. Every Saturday and Sunday, they, you know, they they pile up out here and have the well, ball games. And uh, if they won't play here, they go in Rocky Hot, playing in Rocky Hot. Or even with call rain. Once in a while, they go to Lipsy and play play the Cotton Mill team over there. Daddy was a baseball player. Uh, he played uh, on teams all around the area. He and his brother. So he was real interested in baseball, and he'd see the, the, he was seeing the kids play out here. They didn't have a backstop, you know. They, uh, they just made up their own, uh, lined up the field, and, like we did, you know, sure. when you made it up. And he he just one day decided, you know, they ought to have decent equipment. So he bought he bought equipment for the field, uh, lime to lime it, put a backboard on the back of it and I think a lot of uh, gloves and balls and bats as well. The thing that I remember was when we first, I first started noticing boys, this meeting over there, and just talking and hanging out, you know. <laughs> I used to love to play. I, I was little, and of course they didn't want me out there in the way because the big kids were playing, but they would put up with us. <laughs> well, if some, someone got sick, they didn't get paid if they didn't work. So if somebody got sick in a family, one of the workers, the mother or the dad, people would go around, they called it a pounding. Basically, you would go get, uh, if you got sick, if you were out of work in a definite period of time, somebody over here, grown-ups and kids, would get together with little wagons and pull it. And the term pounding 
come knocking on doors. Mr. or Miss so-and-so is sick. They're not able to work. Is there anything you care to give? I remember that. I put that right there as one of my fondest memories of growing up over here. People helping people. Well, yeah, I I remember getting my wagon out and doing pounding several times. I, I would, and we'd go fill up the wagon and take it to Sam's house because Sam was sick and he wasn't working. It was just a way of showing our love for each other, you know, to help, to help each other. Do other people need help? You help them. I can remember my father going to the mill and collecting money for a friend that lived down the street. I was a majorette and she wanted to be in the majorettes and she didn't have the money. And my father came to the mill and collected enough money so that she could be in the majorettes as well. The railroad track is uh, the dividing line. You know, the mill people are different from the town people. And, I, and folks would tell me that once in a while. I said, I, I didn't feel it. I suppose it's real. There were, there were clumps of different people, different economic scales all around the town. It wasn't just a mill. In my mom and dad's day, yes, that was true to a degree. But in my day, no. I never felt stigmatized whatsoever. I had friends, and I was never ashamed to, you know. I came from the mill village, and they knew it. Just the big thing is, it's not about where you're raised, it's who you are. I did have a friend, uh, Jethro, and every morning when he got to class, he'd be late. And every time the teacher would ask you, what happened to you? He would say, train stopped me. So we just named him Train Jethro, and for the rest of his time in school, he was Train Jethro. I don't feel the stigma a lot of people. I have one family member that totally despises it. I, he lived a different life than I did. It was not something that was unique to this mill. It was sort of a thing with the age. You know, you, if, you lived in, if you worked in the mill and lived in the mill village, there was a, a, a sort of feeling it was the wrong side of tracks. I don't know that anybody uh, in my experience ever made me feel that way, it was sort of, you know, it was there and we knew it. Where my mother told me that she always felt like she lived on the wrong side of the tracks because uh, of the perception on the other side of the track towards anybody who was from the mill, even management. Well, you know, it, it never bothered me. I, I've, I've heard, and it is true, it was, you know, we were called lint heads. Uh, uh, was that, you know, getting cotton dust in your head and then you took the pro blow pipe and blow it out. It was a stigma, you would come up on the cotton mill, but uh, kind of looked down on you a little way. But uh, I don't, I, as I went to school and so forth, I didn't see they had no more than I did. So, it, you know, so I was happy like that. I was happy. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of anything. Now, I never actually heard the term linhead until I read a book that uh, Keith Nixon gave me to read. But I knew we were looked upon differently, but I didn't for a very long time. I knew I had what I needed. I had love, I had food on the table, I had clothes to wear to school, and I had parents that loved me. I don't know of anything else I could have needed. But everything is generational. And people change, times change, and places change, and events change. The mill, um, as I said, shut down. It was sold in 1990 to a company from Sanford, North Carolina, and it was Pioneer Yarns. And then it was sold in 93 to a large conglomerate, which was Unify. Unify was convinced to donate the property to Preservation North Carolina, which is a nonprofit 5013C group that, that actually saved properties, but they had never done anything but uh, homes um, buildings, but nothing like this. Uh, when Preservation North Carolina was given the gift of this property, they sold the Mill Village houses that were salvageable to people who would remodel it, and the covenants were set up, and you had to follow the covenants. But there were five houses that were too far gone to uh, restore, so uh, they sold those lots, but when you bought the lot, they handed you the plan because they had had an architect draw it up so that it would look similar, but not exact. Miss Sissy was the oldest 
lady owned it here that you know, worked in the mill. And I'd go sit on her porch. She was 90 some years old then. And I'd go sit on her porch and we would talk about, please don't let them tear the house this time. This is a memory. This is a life. It will always be. They did not put the people out who had been workers in the mill who were still renting the little mill houses. They left those people there, and then as they passed away, or if they moved away, then they would put that house on the market for people to restore it. Otherwise, these buildings would have just rotted down, fallen down, been torn apart, and now this is a vibrant, charming neighborhood. People, you know, people were thrilled to see what happened. Right. It didn't get tore down. It's not condos over here or whatever it would have been. I don't know what it would have been. I'm, I think about it for Dad. I think he would be extremely pleased. He was interested in history too and preserving the history of this place. I think he would be very pleased with it and the, pleased with the way they did it. And one thing that would be special about it is his assistant, uh, Beth Taylor, was right in the middle of all of this. I think for this village in this town that the condos have worked well. One of the condos is being sold, so they were selling some of the stuff out of So when I walked in and I'm looking at the floor and I'm looking at those old what travelers that, uh, that are still embedded in the floor. You know, we needed something that would tell the story here. This museum that we have, you know, tells that story. Any time that we can preserve any of our history, we need to, because we have to learn from our history. That's why we. That's why it got started. So it is because we had, you know, as a group of us who, who loved the mill and wanted to see it, 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 it preserved as you were talking about preservation. To see it preserved for a lifetime. Yeah. Preservation has done a wonderful job in keeping this preserved uh, and also making it modern. It's probably been one of the highlights of my life. Uh, I completely changed careers when I went to work at PNC, but to see it come alive, to see it um, develop like it was developed, and to see what came out of this um, has just kind of been, it's been one of the biggest um, thrills in my life. This video is dedicated to all the men and women who were employed by the Edenton Cotton Mill from its beginning in 1900 until its closing in 1995. As they worked hard to support their families, they also formed a close-knit Mill Village family while making valuable contributions to the economy of the town of Edenton. <laughs>